Whatever your view of fossil fuels, they have shaped our country and this continent, where we live and work, our standard of living, even our place in the world. This resource was created over hundreds of millions of years as North America evolved. Vast seas were formed where Alberta is today. Marine life would be buried under sediments, and with time and pressure, massive oil and gas deposits were formed. And the newest resource is oil. It was just 160 years ago in Enniskillen Township, Ontario, and not far away in Titusville, Pennsylvania, that the North American oil industry began in earnest. As soon as that first well blew in, things began to happen. It would be almost another century before the discovery that would change the way we live and uncork Alberta's vast energy potential. Near the little town of Leduc, Alberta, Imperial Leduc No. 1 struck oil. That strike would set off an economic gusher for the country, and so began the business of moving oil long distance by pipeline. Trench and pipe, trench and pipe, for more than a thousand miles. In 1949, the interprovincial pipeline would be the first major delivery of oil to the United States and on to eastern Canada. At first, ships carried oil through the Great Lakes to the country's industrial heartland in southern Ontario. Meanwhile, another Alberta fossil fuel began to make its mark, natural gas, what had first been burned off as a volatile side effect in early oil production. So it was mostly a nuisance because it obstructed access to liquid petroleum. As the technology developed, we were able to do more with natural gas. Together, oil and natural gas brought affordable energy for industry, heating for homes and gasoline for cars. Energy royalties and taxes would be a foundation for Canadian health care, education and a growing economy. So almost uh, all of the facets that we think of as contemporary urban industrial life in Canada was driven by this unleashing of fossil fuel energy that took place in the mid 20th century. There was a pipeline boom out of Alberta. First, the interprovincial pipeline, oil to the Great Lakes and on to eastern Canada. The first Trans Mountain pipeline to the west coast. The first major natural gas pipeline, the Trans Canada, all in the 1950s. A network spread, oil pipelines, gas pipelines, bringing energy from where it was found to where it could be consumed across North America. In Canada, eventually 840,000 kilometers of pipelines, large and small. And for a generation, oil and gas surging through pipelines met little public resistance. But that would change. In the early 1970s, after natural gas was found in the Beaufort Sea, plans to build a pipeline from the Arctic through the natural beauty of the Mackenzie River Valley sparked vigorous opposition. How come they have no rights? For more than two years, a public inquiry by Justice Thomas Berger considered not only the economic benefits, but the cultural, social and environmental impact on Indigenous people and others. It was a turning point in Canadian resource development. We started to be able to see uh, groups of farmers, suburban residents in the cities where the pipelines would pass through and Indigenous people uh, in Canada having an opportunity to express what concerns they might have. The development of new energy pipeline infrastructure became slower um, and more complicated as more consultation was required. Half a world away, a similar path of resource expansion in the Soviet Union. By the 1970s, Western Europe was growing dependent on Russian energy, especially natural gas. While the Soviets increased their military strength... In 1981, U.S. President Ronald Reagan, alarmed by Soviet military expansion, imposed sanctions to try to block a pipeline from Siberia to Europe, but with little success. I imposed an embargo on selected oil and gas equipment to penalize this sector of the Soviet economy. Well, it's no secret that our allies didn't agree with this action. And as the Soviet Union broke up, Russia and Europe became entwined with oil and gas pipelines. By last year, the EU was getting over 40% of its natural gas from Russia. At the time, it actually seemed like a really reasonable path that, that Russia looked like it was beginning to liberalize. I think there was a view of engaging with a post-Soviet Russia was, uh, was an excellent means of bringing them into the international community and kind of influencing them along a positive path that way. <laughs> By 2022, Russia's war on Ukraine caused many Europeans to regret that dependence. But how to disconnect and replace Russian pipelines and Russian gas? 
the geography here just plays such a large role. Now, however, obviously, a lot of those kind of geographic convenience uh, decisions, like a, an over-dependence on Russian uh, supplies, are coming home to roost for Europe, given kind of a very unreliable supplier in Moscow currently. Can Canada help? Not easily or quickly. Night and day, good weather and bad, the work pressed forward. Seventy years ago, climate change was not foreseen, and indigenous voices were not heard. The fossil fuel economy enjoyed almost non-stop growth. Today, environmental regulations are more stringent, indigenous Canadians have more power to defend their interests, and just getting shovels in the ground can take years. The first Trans Mountain pipeline was oil for British Columbians and exceedingly popular. The new Trans Canada, oiled chiefly for export, is widely unpopular in BC with much greater awareness of environmental risk. The Coastal Link natural gas pipeline is moving forward, but with billions in cost overruns and some hereditary chiefs still trying to stop it. The dynamics of the environmental politics changed almost entirely and environmental factors became uh, much more central to the debate. Even if you go back to the 19th century, you can see industry commentators reflecting on this, the trapped resource problem for Canada. Once upon a time, the oil and gas was far from North American markets, while it's even further from European markets. Maybe there's a business case to be made for liquefied natural gas infrastructure on the East Coast, or will it make more sense for Canadian LNG interests to focus on Asia? Or is the future hydrogen? Canada has energy options. The challenge is calculating where to invest billions of dollars on long-term projects with so much near-term uncertainty. The climate is changing quickly. Global politics can turn on a dime, and decisions need to be made.